recording with you after it is processed and uh, uh, let me share my screen so we can start talking about risk management so uh, so what happened today is actually a very good example for risk management so um i suppose early in 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 the course to see because you know i'm aware this is a known risk uh, i'm aware that sometimes if the time change comes in the middle of the course we need to adjust the time i need to make sure that um um uh, uh, i shift everything one hour uh, forward or backward it depending on the season so because i didn't do this uh, i didn't notice uh, last night that we will uh, change the time now because i depended on a friend that uh, she's no longer with us uh, she used it to send us email every uh, season telling us to change it so this this actually a very good example uh, uh, for risks that might happen and it's known unknown or no 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 it's known known because we know that it will happen so let's let's talk about uh, risk management uh, i will try to cut the time for um a, uh, the exercises a little bit but what is risk what is risk Suicide. Uh, suicide. Unexpected, <laughs> unexpected event could uh, has negative impact on uh, project or task. Yes, it's unexpected. Yes, event. It's an event. Something that will happen. But the key word here is uncertain. Risk equals uncertainty. We are not certain if this event or condition will happen or not. And back in the day, um, um, in project management, we only focused on negative risks, like threats. But later, we said, actually, it could be positive or negative. There might be something positive that will happen that maybe will help in accelerating the project or maybe it will help us save some money uh, or um, <clears throat> deliver the project in a higher quality or something like this so they expanded the definition of risk to include either positive or negative risk okay so it's uncertainty it's related to uncertainty something that we are not certain that it will happen or not um but we need to manage it we need to include it in our planning we need to sit down um, and ask what can go wrong or what can go right how can we minimize the impact of the negative risks or how can we benefit from uh, positive risks who will be responsible for this risk if it happens uh, how much money do we need to respond uh, to these risks? So it's very important <clears throat> to have this, and actually it, is in, it should be included in your project management plan. A whole section in your project management plan should, in, should be geared towards risk management. So early, uh, in uh, the, uh, the the project, the chance for uh, risks is very high. The more you reach um, a, um, a, the end of the project, <clears throat> um, the chances goes down. However, now the cost of fixing a risk event that will happen towards the end of the project will be higher 
because it will jeopardize what you already did. So that's why you need to include it early in the planning phase and you keep monitoring these risks along the way when you are uh, managing your project. Um, there is a certification for risk management for those of you who will be interested. I got the certification from the PMI. It's a risk management professional and the whole study focuses on risk. It's a whole discipline. Uh, and right now in, in organizations, there are professionals only dedicated for risks. Uh, from my experience, uh, I find that people uh, from the finance background, um, they are familiar with this because we have uh, enterprise risk. <clears throat> so they calculate risks and assess risks at um, the organizational level. And also those who work in uh, consulting doing feasibility studies, uh, also they are aware of this and uh, this discipline. So when you have a good solid risk management plan, uh, you will be proactive rather than reactive. Because you thought about the potential risks that might happen and you prepared yourself and your team how you will handle these risks. Uh, we try to do a thorough analysis as much as we can, but we still might have some risks that we did not we, we did not think uh, about. But at least you will not have these surprises. Um, so, and also because our assessment will include uh, assessing certain risks, why they will happen, um, uh, what we will do when, when uh, they happen, so we will be prepared preparedness, uh, this the, this term, what uh, what we call. And we can uh, control what's happening uh, in uh, our project. So there is a, a process. Uh, it, of course, it starts with risk identification. We will identify uh, the source of risk, sources of risk. And here, as I said, right now, uh, they expanded the term risk to include positive and negative risks. But uh, frankly speaking, most of the time we are thinking of the negative, what can go uh, uh, wrong. So we will identify the sources of risks, where these risks might come from. We will assess these risks because not all the risks will have the same impact. Um, in terms of severity, how much damage it, it, it will make to the, to, uh, uh, to the project, uh, or the probability of happening. Uh, some risks might be, um, you know, one in a million, and some risks might be one in a hundred. So shall I... Uh, uh, keep thinking of that risk that will happen one in a million and uh, not dedicate this time and effort and money to a risk that it will happen one in a hundred. So the likelihood of occurring or in some other literature, uh, they call it probability. Uh, uh, will be another dimension that we assess risks against. Uh, the third dimension is controllability. If this happens, uh, how controllable it is? How how can I control uh, uh, this? Do I have enough uh, power to control uh, this event? Let me see if anyone joined. Okay, no, we are good. Uh, the third step is to think of the right or appropriate response if this risk happens. So we have, we, we, we need to craft a strategy. If this happened, how can I reduce the impact? Um, um, what will be the contingency plan? Um, uh, the next step is 
the risk uh, uh, response control. So we implement the strategy or the plan that we created and we monitor if new risks happen. And you can see here this, the, this new risks here, new risks here, new risks here, because along the way when you are executing your project, new risks might come. So you need to include it in your risk plan. So that's why we don't do this process once. Sometimes we need to repeat certain uh, steps over and over and over to assess, do we have any new risks emerged? How can we deal with these risks? What is the right response? Do we have resources to respond to these risks? So risk management is one of the processes that we do it um, uh, continuously uh, throughout the project. So the first step is to generate a list of all the possible risks that might uh, emerge. Okay, we have... Yes, Mohammed. Yes. Uh, good evening, Professor. First, Hi, uh, uh, first of all, uh, is crisis management part of risk management or two separate uh, issues? Crisis management is at the level of the organization. We don't use uh, the term crisis management in project management. Okay. However you could include it in your identify uh, in the step of uh, the identification and i think the um crisis the term crisis to um to reflect the severity of the impact yes, of that but, event but usually a crisis is is unplanned or not un unexpected so yes if, if we return the slide uh, back just the slide back. Yeah. Here. Can we add it here in the new risks? I can, uh, I can say the example for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, share your example, yes. Uh, and this year, uh, we were planning to manufacture around 600, 680 million Saudi real uh, to be manufactured. Unfortunately, we have a crisis in cash flow. Um, the banks reduce our credit limit so we didn't have the money to buy raw material so our sales have decreased this was not expected this was suddenly and uh, unplanned or whatever yeah so yeah. all this year we were managing uh, as prices uh, putting strategy uh, step by step mm -hmm. and uh, spontaneously actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because so you, was, you mm -hmm. nothing was planned and it was suddenly uh, the bank reduced our credit limit. So they whatever cash we get from the market, they take it. So we didn't have uh, money to buy raw materials. We didn't manufacture. We didn't have products. Mm -hmm. and We have to sell to get more money. Mm hmm. Well, this is uh, could be classified under what we call unknown unknowns. It means that I, I'm really oblivious, uh, oblivious and don't know any clue about this event happening in the future. So uh, we classify risks. There are se se several types of risks. Um, so the step of risk identification, I'm trying to think of all the possible risks that might happen. And I move risks from unknown to known. So yes, I know that these risks might happen. Will they happen or not? I need to add to assess this. But also in, in um, usually in enterprise risk management, what you what you are talking about now is about enterprise risk management. 
uh, not project risk management. Of course, it will affect it, uh, your project, but it's 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 higher level. So in in dealing with uh, risks, we have contingency plans that's uh, related to a contingency uh, reserve. And also we have what we call management reserve. I don't know if you have this in your strategic plan uh, or not, but we but you you should have your company should have what we call management reserve. So this is a fund that is set aside only senior management and the highest uh, authority in the company have access to it so they can deal with such unknown unknown. Uh, sometimes they call it black swans. In some other literature, they call it black swans because black swans are very rare. You know, so uh, this is something, a, a very rare event. That's why it's unknown unknown. We didn't know that. But in, in the project level, in the project level, uh, usually, we, usually you will start with the funds of the project locked in. So this is the term. Let me write it in, in the chat box. Locked in. So the money for the project is already, you know, uh, uh, looked in for uh, and assigned for this uh, project uh, through different accounts. So the, um, um, of course, the accounting professionals will um, will assign certain tasks or phases to certain uh, certain accounts. Yeah. Mohammed, please mute. Yes. Uh, no, I think Mohammed is it. Yeah. Uh, but if I have the research fund for the project and I have such an unexpected event, so mm -hmm. I might reallocate the budget that affects the project. Yes, that's why. Okay, don't 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 step ahead because uh, uh, when we do our analysis and we do our management. Um, uh, risk management plan, uh, we have to calculate the contingency reserve. So it's not only the money that you will spend on executing your project, but also you, you as a project manager will have access to a contingency reserve. You can use it only when you are responding to specific risks according to your plan. If you faced a risk that is not at the level of the project, uh, it has to be dealt with um, a, at the higher level. So the senior management should have also access to a management reserve so they can support your project through the funds from the management reserve. If you do it or not, this is a whole different story. I have seen uh, when you do, uh, for example, a budget for your department and you include uh, these reserves, the next year when you are asking for the budget and they find that, okay, you did not use uh, the funds in your contingency um, uh, reserve or fund, we will not give you this money for you. I have seen senior management think this way. So department managers uh, try to, to, to use all the budget as uh, allocated for them uh, before the end of the fiscal year. So the, 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 the senior management will give them the money they ask for. Yeah. So le le let's go back to the, uh, the risk management process. This risk management process, we apply it at the project level. And actually, right now, I'm working with the PMI on um, updating the risk management uh, guide book. And we also included organizational risks, and we included uh, portfolio level risks. We included um, a program level risk because 
all these risks could ascend to the project level and some of the risks at the project level might escalate to the program and portfolio uh, levels. So back to the process, we start with identification. We identify what could go wrong. We assess these risks um, so we can give enough attention to those risks with the um, a highest severity of impact or highest likelihood. <clears throat> and also we understand how controllable a risk is. Uh, then we develop the response. How, if this happens, uh, how can we respond? What we will do? Uh, who will be responsible for uh, implementing this response? How much will it cost us? And this is very important because when we calculate how much will it cost us to respond, we can create the contingency uh, reserves. And throughout the project, we are doing this process iteratively. So if any risks happen again, we are uh, prepared for this. Uh, this is also important. Remember when we uh, did um, a, the work breakdown structure? Okay, now now uh, other students. Um, yeah. Remember when we did the work breakdown structure? We create a similar structure, but for risks. And we will see how how this will um, um, uh, will be done. So we create a graph showing uh, the different risks uh, uh, arising in different areas um, and how it will affect or impact. Uh, for those who joined us now, uh, I encourage you to watch uh, the recording when it is ready um, to see um, um, the few minutes. Uh, before we start, before you joined, okay. So this is this is the risk breakdown structure. So here, technical, external, organizational, project management, customer. These are the different sources of risks. Where risks can come from, um, and within each source that we identified what risks could ha could happen. And we will have um, a, um, an example that we will work on. So the sources of risks could happen from so many uh, 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 sources. Some risks might be related to the technical aspects of the project. Maybe risks related to the requirements or the technology that we are using or the complexity of the project uh, or the quality standards uh, and requirements of the project. Some risks are external. So in the example that Mohammed Abu Layla shared with us, it was external. So some risks come from the subcontractors or the suppliers. That's why, for example, you want to choose your suppliers to be stable. Because what happens if this supplier is uh, unstable in the market and in the middle of the project, they go out of business, for example. Or regulatory. So while you are working on your uh, project using uh, certain compliance standards, the government changes the standards or something related to the market or the weather uh, or uh, maybe wars or unrest uh, in certain areas that will impact, uh, you know, uh, maybe trade routes or fluctuation in um, 
uh, uh, exchange rate or something like this. Uh, some sources are related to the organizational level. Maybe this project, project is dependent on another project. So if the other project is facing some issues, it will impact your project. Uh, or uh, you, you face something related to resource availability. There are shared resources with other projects and it will impact your project. Or maybe one of your team members will leave. This is very, very common when we do this identification workshop. Uh, we include this. If it happens that uh, a software engineer will leave, uh, how we will deal with this? Or problems related to funding or prioritization. So it, it, the priority of your project uh, decreased. So whenever they need uh, resources, for example, they take your team. <laughs> Uh, also, we have uh, uh, risks related to the project management. So maybe we um, did some mistakes in our calculations, in our estimating, or our planning was too optimistic, or we didn't have the, um, a, the right mechanism to control the project. Uh, or we have some communication issues. Uh, some risks might be related uh, to the customer. The customer maybe did not identify the requirements very well. So when, when we do this and they, it's their time to accept the project, they don't accept it. Uh, or we were coordinating with a certain employee within the customer company, but they they left and the new employee responsible for the coordination and communication um, is, is, you know, um, needs some orientation or doesn't know uh, much about the project. Or maybe they don't have enough training or support or something like this. So this is what we call the risk breakdown structure. So we can understand the sources of the different possible risks that might happen and, and, and where they can come from. And of course, it's not just limited to these um, uh, uh, risks you need to identify. That's why here is, for example, uh, there might be risks related to the design or testing or the schedule or the budget or the contractors. So you need to think of these. And you can see that we use questions here. Risk In risk management, we ask a lot of questions. Do we, uh, are the requirements stable? Did we collect all the requirements? Did we include the right stakeholders so we are not missing any part of the requirements? And so on. So it's it's like playing the devil's advocate. And maybe that's why I love uh, risk management and I specialized in. Um, once we identify the risks, the, po the potential, risk that that might happen we need to assess these risks so there are several ways that we or methods that we uh, we use um if the project is strategic very important or um, um uh, the cost is so high we might use all these methods if it is not that, we might use one or two uh, methods. Some of these are qualitative and some are quantitative. Uh, qualitative means it's subjective. Even if we use some calculations, as we will see now, it's still subjective, still not a definite number. Uh, it's an estimate. Um, the other 
uh, methods are uh, uh, quantitative. It means that it's objective because because we used the inputs and we did a thorough analysis, usually math using mathematic mathematical uh, models. Uh, so we have uh, numbers here. So we have uh, a very famous analysis called Monte Carlo analysis. Have you heard about it? So it's one of the um, uh, the methods that we can use, and we and and we need to do it using a software. So we cannot use it um, um, like the same way we will use other uh, methods. So some are quantitative, some are qualitative. Usually we start with the qualitative, uh, so we can understand the um, the characteristics of these risks. What is the possible impact? What is the probability? Um, uh, what is the uh, detection, detection, detectionability of this risk? And when we have a risk value high, we can use the other uh, methods on it so we can further understand this risk. So, this is this this is a form that um, you, we use, and although we have some numbers here, it's still subjective uh, because it's it's it depends on estimates. So, if the risk uh, will um, uh, cause insignificant cost increase in the project, we will give it very low or one. If it will lead to 10% cost increase, it's two or low. 10 to 20, it's moderate. 20 to 40, high. More than 40% increase, very high. Uh, Sometimes we add more, um, not only the project objectives, but uh, we might include um, other aspects. Um, um, uh, for example, resources or staffing. Uh, but usually these are the main um, objectives. And you can see that these are the constraints. How it will affect the time or the schedule? Again, and, and, and see, these are all subjectives. We sit together as a team and we say, okay, we will consider 5 to 10% is, is a moderate risk. Uh, 10 to 20 is high. More than 20, very high. In another project, we might increase these numbers or decrease it. For example, this is a very important uh, project. It's very expensive. So the 10% cost increase is actually very high because this project will cost us millions. So you might find the numbers totally different. So it depends on the project, uh, the experience of the team, uh, and um, also very important here, it depends on the risk tolerance of the organization. Sometimes you work with a top management who are risk averse. Uh, they avoid risks. They avoid any changes. Uh, uh, even one percent change in a plan will give them panic attack. So when the risk tolerance is very very low in in an organization, these numbers tend to be very low because we cannot accept risks. We don't want this. We want to be ready 100% for any uh, change in the future. So this is one of the tools that uh, uh, we use. And based on this, remember, we, we will analyze all the risks based on the criteria that we set here. So we will, uh, think of risk number one. 
how about the cost? If it, it, if it will happen, will it increase the cost? Yes. How much? 15%. Uh, so it's moderate. Uh, will it impact the time? Yes. How uh, uh, how much? Um, it might increase it to 15%, so it's high. And we calculate a number for this risk. Um, here is a form, and of course you will find that there are other forms that are more sophisticated, but here it's very simplified. So here is a list of all the risk events that could happen. The likelihood of these risks, again, it's subjective. So when we sit together as, uh, as a team, uh, you might have an expert uh, team member who were included in projects similar to your project several times. And they might say, you know what, uh, the likelihood of this problem to happen is high. I have worked in 50 projects and 40 projects of the 50, we faced this uh, problem. So instead of giving it three or two or one, we will give it four. The impact, where we get it from the criteria that we assigned here. The impact is high or low or moderate. Uh, detection difficulty, this is also important. Can we easily detect this risk uh, early enough to respond? Or, no, actually, uh, it will crash the system. So, it will be weeks before it manifests in the project. So, uh, the higher the difficulty to detect this risk happening, uh, we will give it a higher, um, a, a higher um, uh, number. And also, when? When it might happen? And we will see later that we talk about the trigger. There might be some event that might happen before this happens. Um, for example, maybe there will be some cracks before the uh, the building collapses, for example. And we use, in, in some other literature, uh, you might find uh, this uh, called heat map. They create heat maps uh, for, uh, for the risks or risk matrix, um, uh, risk severity matrix. So we assign each risk a value, uh, a value based on impact times probability times detection. In some other projects, they use only impact and probability. So based on the risk value, we put it on the, uh, the heat map or the matrix. So those risks in the red zone, uh, these are major risks. We have to assess these risks more thoroughly, um, uh, maybe assign it to um, a, a higher position that has more authority to deal with these risks. So we give it more attention. And then we go to the, the moderate risks, and then we go to the minor risks or these risk green uh, zone. So let's have a quick exercise together, okay? So your team is assigned to develop a mobile app for a coffee shop, a local coffee shop here called uh, Brew Haven. The project duration is six months. Uh, the key stakeholders for this project is, of course, the, uh, the, the coffee shop owner, the coffee shop staff, and the customers. Uh, the project scope, you will create an app that allows customers to browse the menu, place orders, and pay uh, for their orders. And they come 
and pick their order. Uh, I'm not sure if you have uh, have seen this these similar apps. So, for example, here in Canada, we have Tim Horton. So I have an app on my cell phone, Tim Horton, and I I will select the branch. Uh, maybe I'm going to the university. I'm teaching there, so I will select the br the branch at the university, and I will place my order. And I will say, okay, I will come to pick my order at 10:50, for example, and I will pay for it. And I go and I give them the the, the barcode or the number, and I pick my order and leave. So this is the app. Um, uh, also in the scope, we integrate a loyalty program that rewards customers for frequent purchases. So it, 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 it calculates how many times I ordered and it gives me points. And of course, the rewards based on the points. Uh, also included, it's uh, to implement notification features to inform customers about the special offers and promotions. Uh, so, for example, we are in the fall or the autumn. Uh, we have uh, in Tim Horton, they, they have um, specific coffees uh, that's only uh, for that time. Okay. And that's all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is your um, uh, and of course it it should be available on uh, Android and iOS. Okay, so I will divide you into um, uh, into groups, and I want you to think of all the possible risks that might happen in this project. Okay, so any question? Any question before we go to the breakout rooms? Uh, yes, Professor Hanan, uh, I, mm -hmm. I have a question uh, in the previous slide for this uh, metrics about uh, the risk uh, potential versus uh, impact. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, to know what uh, what is on the X, uh, uh, the X and Y is here. What is uh, the measure? Uh, okay, it's it's the risk value. Here, it's the risk value that we will um, uh, we will assign. Uh, that's why if if it is three, it's actually three axes. Uh, if it is only two, impact and probability. So it will be the likelihood. Probability is the likelihood and impact. Uh, uh on the other uh one i have it here like this so we have here the impact we have here the likelihood and it's 2d because we are we, we only include two um uh two uh, uh criteria uh here in this matrix it should be a 3d by the way it should be a 3D because we have three axes, three axes. But in real life, usually uh, it's impact and uh, likelihood or uh, um, uh, or probability. And see that we, we sometimes use certain words interchangeably. So, uh, uh impact might be a, a severity in other tools probability could be likelihood uh, a detection could be detectionability uh, also we might include another dimension called the controllability but i was trying to 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 you know to to make it easier for us to understand it so we might add other other dimensions like controllability, detectionability. But for for the purpose of this class, we will only use impact and probability, or impact and likelihood. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we will go into our uh, uh, groups.
or actually we don't have enough time uh, for this because I want to co compact it. So I want you all to think of what could go wrong in this project, in developing this mobile app. What could go wrong? Anyone in the IT sector? <laughs> I can say from my personal experience in such apps mm. that sometimes some of the menu disappear. Some of the menu disappear? Yes. Okay, so where it will be? Let's use this one. Where you will put it? What is the source of this risk? Technical. Technical, yeah. It could be complexity and interface. Yes. What else? What what other um, possible risks that can happen? Data breach. Excuse me. Data breach. Yes, data breach. Uh, uh, privacy. So it will be external under regulatory. Mm, what else? Maybe a network uh, outage. Okay, so again, it's external, right? Correct. Yeah, so it's external and we will add network. Uh, maybe wrong code? Wrong code. So it will be uh, under technical. Internal. Yeah, and it's yes. uh, uh, um, maybe under, under technology. technology. Yeah, under technology. Mm. Also, it might be not enough budget. Yes, and 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 maybe uh, there is a root cause for this. Yes. So we estimated the um, uh, the costs wrongly. Sometimes we also use something called fishbone diagram. Have you heard this before? Fishbone. Ishikawa. Yes. Okay, let me let me find. Uh, okay, let me share the whole screen so I can we can we can see. It, it has a lot of names. They also called the cause and effect. And yes. Like, uh, yes. yes, 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 yes. So um, here. So here, for example, uh, okay, let's let's use another one. Uh, okay, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. So we call it fish bone because it looks like the fish. So here we add the uh, the defect that will happen or the risk that will happen. And uh, we will have the different sources. And under these sources for uh, the risks, we, we might have all the risks. And um, OK, let me choose another complicated one. Maybe this one. Professor, for example, yep. if uh, uh this application uh through application will come more customer than we can um serve and they will yes. uh, put more order than we have staff uh, to serve it it's also some kind of risks yes 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 so see here uh, uh under infrastructure for example they identified this risk and actually they identified another uh causes for this risk and one of them they identified another causes so we, here we are trying to reach the root cause the root cause for uh, for such uh, a risk so we can treat the right way so it's it's somehow similar to the risk of breakdown structure but it's it's uh, in this fishbone um, uh, diagram so I have actually solved this. So I here identified that uh, we might have technical risks, we might have financial risks, human resources risks, 
uh, customer risks, competition risks, and regulatory risks. So you said something about a security breach. It could be here under regulatory. Um, and there might be some uh, changes in the privacy or data protection regulations. Uh, uh, or maybe if this uh, app will be deployed in another countries, it needs more customization. Um, uh, legal challenges related to the loyalty program. We have terms uh, of use. Uh, for competition, uh, maybe the uh, competing company, uh, uh, coffee shops, launching similar apps. And this will impact actually our market share because their apps are better than ours. Uh, customer uh, risks. So, um, uh, uh, negative feedback or low app adoption rate. So, for example, this particular workshop is so popular among uh, senior uh, demographics, for example, and they don't adapt this uh, app as much as the younger generations, for example. So, we 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 have to have this workshop and everyone will think of the potential risks and here also this could be positive risk so the one that you said uh, we will have more uh, orders than the capacity of the branch or uh, the branches or the coffee shop this is actually a positive risk right so we need to prepare for for this if if this might happen and we create the heat map or the matrix and uh, i will assess these risks based on um, a likelihood uh, and impact and each of these risks will have a number so for example our assessment for data privacy concerns uh, on the impact it was five it has a, a very high impact and the likelihood uh, also is very high. So this is a risk that I need to further investigate and prepare the right, uh, uh, the right response if this happens. Uh, for budget outruns, for example, this might happen. Uh, it's in in the red zone, so we have to go to our planning and make sure that uh, we are uh, within the budget and we see uh, uh, if there are certain events that will cause budget overrun. So based on this analysis, we think of how can we respond to these risks? And here we have one, two, three, four, five, five different ways that we can respond uh, to risks. The first one is mitigation or mitigating the risk. So I will try to reduce the likelihood that this risk will happen. Or I will try to reduce the impact. So, for example, if if we see the budget outruns that I, I mentioned, I will try to lower the likelihood this will happen. So I might uh, create contingency plans uh, uh, that include a reserve, a certain reserve. So, so if this happens, uh, I will respond to it. Or I will do thorough planning and I will increase my uh, safety factors in my calculations. So I'll make sure that we don't have this budget overruns. Um, avoiding risks. So I will change the plan altogether. Um, uh, so for example, uh, if we have, um, uh, yeah, maybe technical compatibility issues. Uh, I might 
not, uh, uh, let's say we have some issue with a certain platform. I'm just thinking out loud, you know, you can help me uh, with the right uh, response here. Uh, we say, okay, it's, it's for only iOS platforms. Why? Because the technology that we have um, it doesn't um, is not compatible with Android, for example. Uh, or we will use um, a, a programming language that will enable me to easily adapt uh, the code to another platform. So I'm trying to avoid it. So I will change the plan. Uh, so I will avoid this risk from happening. Another response strategy is transferring. And the prominent example that we have is a, a, um, a insurance. So we are passing the risk to another party. So, for example, when you have a shipment and uh, you insure this shipment, so anything that will happen to this shipment, the insurance company will compensate you. And usually there is a premium that you pay for transferring uh, risks. So the company will collect this premium and you have to pay this premium as long as the project is, is, is going on. And in case of specific risks, according to the policy, the insurance policy, the insurance company will compensate you. So you are transferring it. Uh, or maybe you will hire a subcontractor. So the subcontractor will be responsible for dealing with these risks. You are not responsible for dealing with these risks. So you are transferring the risk to another uh, a, a party. Uh, another response is escalating risks. So, uh, and, and I mentioned this early in, in the class, if a risk happens at the project level, but as a project manager, you cannot handle this risk at the project level, you escalate it to the higher level. Uh, the last response is retaining risks. So you know what? It might happen. We might have some glitches. We will deal with this. It might extend the, uh, the, uh, the schedule to eight months instead of six months, and we, uh, we are accepting this. Sometimes we call it accepting in other literature. So yes, we accept it. We will deal with this. So for each risk that we identify, we will identify the right response. And again, you can see that there is an element of subjectivity um, because you might choose a response that's not suitable. So that's why we have to do this risk assessment over and over and over throughout the project. So based on the responses that you will choose for these risks, whether you will mitigate some risks, you will change the plans to avoid some risks, you will uh, uh, hire a, a subcontractor or uh, um, uh, you will have an insurance uh, company or you accept the risk and you, you will have a plan to deal with it if it happens, you need to create a contingency plan. The contingency plan will have all these risks uh, the identified risks, all your analysis, and uh, also alternative plans or routes that you will go through if these risks happen. Uh, if there is a budget that you need to assign to certain uh, responses, So again, it's a contingency. So only you use these plans when a risk happens. So if you are very good in planning, um, and 
everything goes right, you will not uh, uh, go to your contingency plans. Uh, also, there are risks associated of not having a contingency plan. So this is very important. Risks of poor risk management. Um, Uh, this is another form um, that we use it to um, to structure the responses. So, of course, we, we will have more information than this. This is a very simplified um, uh, one. But the, there are the main uh, uh, elements here. We have the event that created the risk. We have the response that we agreed on. We have the contingency plan, and of course, these are high level. So you might find reference in uh, the contingency plan itself to give you more information about these um, um, uh, these responses. Uh, the trigger. This is very important. The trigger, the event that will trigger the response. For example, uh, we have interface problems. The teams are work. The team is working on the interface problem, but if it is not resolved within twenty four hours, we will initiate the contingency plan. Uh, here, for example, um, uh, user backlash. Uh, if we get a call from top management we will initiate the contingency plan. So this is the trigger that will trigger the contingency plan, the execution of the contingency plan. And of course, we assign to who is responsible for uh, this risk. <coughs> okay, um, let's have a break, uh, like five minutes or so. And then we will um, we will come to continue this. My plan is to have it like a one hour and a half class. Okay. Um, what if during the execution of project something happened? What we did not we didn't predict such as war then um is it poor risk management no no uh, the, we had this discussion i i, I believe early um, um when muhammad uh, talked about crisis uh and and they call it uh, black swans so this, these are rare events but these are severe events that might uh, impact your project and uh, in the insurance policies, you will find there are some terms called force majeure. So these are uh, major events that's outside your, uh, your control. So if you can include such assessment in your assessment, so for example, right now, most of the businesses include a um, uh, pandemics or endemics. Pandemics means that it's it's uh, uh, it's a disease that get, that goes from uh, a country to country, and also we might have endemic that disease that can be contagious within one country. So before uh, COVID nineteen, for example, here in Canada we have H one. N1, I believe it's the swine, the swine, the swine flu. So it was not pandemic. It was not coming from uh, outside the country, but it it was inside the country. So some businesses had some um, um, some measures um, to deal with such contagious uh, diseases, uh, but at a smaller scale than uh, COVID nineteen, for example. And and why this happened before that, uh, we had something called SARS. So businesses started to 
recognize that okay we might have these different types of flus or or viruses that might impact our businesses so what what can we do if we handle something like this so it's 11 18 now let's have a five minutes uh break okay welcome back welcome back okay we have here a question uh uh, for the project earthquake resilience, can we just accept the risk that during the execution another earthquake might happen? And as a result, we did we don't know when we can continue the project, especially if most of the staff will leave the project. Mm. Uh, well, actually, in some projects, uh, we might consider a risk that uh, um not even very specific like another earthquake that will happen but if it is a risk that um uh, we don't know and the impact will really severe and we have to shut down the project or end the project even a business um uh, uh business planning we do it so uh in in business planning we create the exit strategy at the same time we are creating the business strategy so uh, yeah in some in 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 some um uh, in in some projects we might have like a port is it b or p i'm not sure it's it's it's, it's a port plan it means that uh, we will we will uh, shut down the project uh, and you might think, okay, but we have partial um, uh, uh, deliveries, the deliverables. Sorry, that we uh, we did what we will do it. Um, um, how can we re redeploy uh, the team members? So it it might be uh, a part of your uh, risk management plan. Yeah. okay so what we did right now let's go back all the way to the process so we identified risks so the team sat together and usually um, you might have an expert in this uh, stage uh, so whether they are external consultants or some members uh, from the organization who have uh, the uh, the expertise in similar projects so they can help you analyze uh, the, the different sources of risks that uh, might create risks in uh, in your uh, uh, project so you identify the risks you write down these uh, risks you use uh, different ways to identify the risks and here we are trying to transform unknowns to knowns the more known risks i i i know uh, the better then i will assess these risks so i can um, uh, understand the severity the likelihood of each of uh, uh, these risks uh, and here i will create the heat map you know that red and yellow and and uh, and green uh, or the risk matrix so i can add more focus on um, a, 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 the major risks uh, then we will brainstorm the different responses can we mitigate this risk yes if we cannot mitigate this risk or transfer it or uh, change our plans or something like this we will accept it okay we will accept it that this might happen so what shall we do if this happen uh, for example okay i'm going to some somewhere and i will um um, I will take the public transportation. What if I reach the train station late? 
this is a risk and I accept that it might happen. So my, uh, I have a response to if this happen, I will call an Uber, for example. And then we create the, um, a, the risk response strategies and we create based on these responses, the uh, contingency plans. So what do we have here? Okay, let's let's go I, because I believe I have. Uh, OK, so. More about the contingency planning, OK, so I will. I, uh, that's why I told you what you mentioned here in this form. Uh, you might have uh, uh, another document that uh, tells you more and sometimes it might include a process or something like this, um, uh, more detail. So for those risks, technical risks, what's the contingency plan, backup strategies if choosing technology fails, uh, or assess whether technical uncertainties can be resolved. So we explain exactly what we will do if such risks will happen. Uh, so back to the Blue Haven, uh, we identified several risks. I did not include everything, but I included um, a few ones. So for the risk technical compatibility issues, the team decided that they, if this happened, we will mitigate it. Uh, so it means that we will change the plans so we can respond to this uh, risk. Uh, so the contingency plan is uh, conduct the thorough compatibility testing and the quality assurance. Uh, what's the trigger? Frequent issues arise. And actually, we can here specify if the issues arise uh, are more like 10, sorry, 10 in one month, for example. So we have a specific number that will trigger if, if we reach issue number 10 in one month, we will stop everything and we will conduct a thorough compatibility. Uh, testing. Who is responsible for this? It could be the project manager with a specific team member. Uh, it could be uh, the testing uh, manager or the quality assurance specialist. Another risk event, severe outage or technical uh, uh, glitches. What's the response that we decided? We will avoid it or we will transfer it. How? More explanation. Use cloud-based server uh, with redundancy or have a backup uh, payment system uh, for the customers. What's the trigger? Severe downtown time. Maybe we, we specify more than 24 hours. So in the 25th hour, um, we will move into another uh, cloud-based ser uh, server. Um, who is responsible? We can assign it to a specific person in the IT team um, who will check the server downtime. Um, and once we reach the, the trigger, they will uh, initiate the contingency plan and so on. Uh, yeah, this one is also good. Budget overruns. We decided to, to mitigate how we will conduct uh, periodic financial reviews to control expenses. So throughout the six months of this project, the app project, uh, we will conduct uh, financial reviews every month. And what's the trigger? If the budget deviation is more than, for example, 20%. Uh, who is responsible for this? The finance manager. So, any question um, for anything that we uh, we discussed?
remember we were discussing mainly negative risks because in the definition the, the current definition now about risks it's just an event unexpected uh, or uncertain event that might have impact positively or negatively your project so that's why the uh, the project management institute is uh, also adding more literature about uh, opportunities yes yes sir yes uh, excuse me doctor uh, when we are studying or uh, uh, thinking about the risk mm -hmm. this is we check the risk during the execution of the project or yes. already the project done and the, after the operation of the project and yani we expect the the risk that i already finished my projects and already implemented then i will expect the risk will come after the 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 project started or during the execution of the project no during the uh during the execution of the project okay yeah because no. after you after your project is done you will hand it over right Okay, so when we are talking about the operation, for example, the network problem or technology, that mm -hmm. means the project is finished, then I am making some kind of uh, demonstration or in the some like that, then I mm. can I can so check the example if, that we have. Yes, for example. No, I know I think this is during the execution of the project. Okay. Yeah, if mm. if it is related to to pro uh, to operations, after I hand the op the the product to the operation, so uh, for this uh, Brew Haven, they hire the team to um, um, uh, to develop the app. After they finish, it will be the responsibility of um, uh, the IT team in brew haven case okay so, so it during... will be part of the operation and actually in operations management we also include this we have risk management as well okay so i should consider in my mind while i am executing the project yes. that yes. Is i will maybe face a problem of implementing for example the network or whatever related yes. to the technology right yes yeah okay this could be okay you will develop the uh the project in five months and one month you will test drive the app for example or maybe oh. you have one one year contract with the company to develop oh. and manage the app okay okay yeah but but your question is very good because uh, as i said risk management you will find it at the enterprise level uh, at the portfolio level at the program level at the project level and also in operations management we do risk uh, risk management as well okay for uh, example uh in manufacturing companies we have what we call preventive maintenance yes why because this is a response strategy to a risk that we identified so we will have these frequent uh, maintenance checkups and and maintenance and uh, 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 reviews and checkups to make sure that nothing will happen to interrupt the production excellent mm -hmm. okay so uh, based on as a practical when we are doing a project we will afraid mainly about two impact will affecting due to the risk when we are studying the risk the duration mm -hmm. time and the budget for example mm -hmm. yeah, this is the, the only two things i will be afraid that is due to the risk during the execution it will affecting me to have delay to execute the project okay. and to have another point if this risk will affect me in the budget which i put in the project if there is something else i will be afraid from this one yes yeah. yes um uh, it's 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 related to the project objectives okay so cost as you said something that will impact the budget maybe budget overrun uh, or something that will impact the schedule 
okay. or something that will impact the scope. So maybe it will impact the uh, what's included in the scope. So uh, a risk happens. So instead of me doing what uh, we said that we will do, I have to do other tasks as mitigation of the risk that happened. Or it will impact the uh, the quality. Yes, yes. Okay. Or and actually here right now uh, we uh, we include more ob objectives uh, than this. Um, uh, it will uh, we will include, for example, resources. It will impact uh, the teams that work on uh, this project. Okay, okay, thank you. Doctor. Yeah, this is very, very relevant, uh, for example, in construction. Yes. So, what if something will happen that will impact the, the health and safety of the teams uh, in, uh, on the site? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, in, in, in project, as I said, risk management, it's actually one of the uh, topics that you will find it almost in every function uh, in the business. Uh, and even when you are doing your business plan for your department, for example, you might do some risk uh, risk management as well. And we use similar tools. You will find that you are using similar tools. Uh, you will come across some um, some job titles, for example, enterprise risk manager. So. This is a, a, a professional in risk management and, and they don't only focus on a specific unit, no, they do it on um, a, the organization itself. Yeah. So when you are thinking of the risks, try to think of the project objectives or constraints and you, you try to think of all the sources uh, uh, for the risks. Risks coming from the technical side, risks coming from the financial side, risks coming from the human resources. For example, one of the risks I thought uh, about uh, uh, um, key team member, members leaving the project. Or maybe they are assigned to different projects, so their focus is not on this project. Or the, we discovered that they lack uh, the technical skill for coding, for example. Or uh, the way they coded uh, the, uh, the code uh, is not that efficient. Or they didn't do a thorough documentation. So uh, the implementation team, you know, they don't have enough information to implement it. Something like this. Uh, here also, even staff resistance to adopting the new app. Uh, risks coming from the uh, customers, uh, risks coming from the competition, risks coming from uh, the government regulation or, or things like that. So we, here there is no one size fits all, uh, but you want to be safe being safe better than sorry as we say okay yeah so as i said we were talking about negative risks and for many years we only focused on negative risks uh, and even the word risk was associated with something bad that will happen but in recent years, they decided, no, actually, risk means uncertain event. So this could be a positive or a negative event. So opportunity also is, is good. So it, it will be very beneficial for you as a project manager to discuss with the team, uh, what if something good happens? How can we benefit from this? So as we did with the, with the risk responses for the negative risks, we have also risk responses for the opportunities. Um, for example, uh, we are 
digging the foundation, we have access to one excavator, and during the execution of the project, another excavator is free. So now we can use two machines instead of one, so we can finish this uh, step earlier, so we can accelerate the project, for example. Uh, or um, one of the team members were assigned to another project, they were working with you 50% of their time, and during the execution of your project, they finished the other project, and now they can work 100% uh, of the time. Uh, or maybe uh, a supplier um, uh, contacted you and they said, uh, you know what, I can give you a discount if you can, if, if you order uh, the whole quantity at once or something like this, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking at the top of my head. So there are different responses that also we can respond. So we can exploit, and actually this is a good word, it's not a bad word. Uh, it means that um, uh, we make sure that this happens. We make sure that this opportunity happens. So maybe I will be proactive and contact the supplier and they say, and you say, you know what? If I, if I order the whole uh, uh, quantity, can you give me an extra 10% discount? Uh, or you share. So maybe you create a joint venture with another company and you work it together, so you have your capabilities, they have their capabilities, You so you can share the profit, uh, or um, uh, you capture this opportunity by benefiting. Or maybe you collaborate with another department, uh, so you can share um, uh, this benefit. Um, or you enhance, so you think of actions, that can increase the probability or the positive impact of the opportunity. So maybe the uh, the uh, the supplier uh, uh, contacted you and saying, okay, if you order the whole quantity now, I can give you ten percent, and you can say, how about fifteen? So now you are increasing the positive impact of uh, this opportunity. Or you escalate it. Again, uh, you 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 identify this opportunity, uh, but you cannot take the decision. For example, uh, one of your team members discovered that if you use a certain alloy, uh, it will enhance the performance of the project. Okay, but we are working with specific design. Uh, requirements and I cannot take the decision myself to replace a material with, with another material. So I will escalate it to the engineering department, for example, and I ask their opinion, can we replace this material with another material or not? Um, uh, the, uh, the last one is accept. Okay. If this happens, I will take advantage of the opportunity, um, but I am not going to take active uh, actions uh, to pursue it. I'm not going to call the vendor. If they call me, this is good. If they don't call me, I'm not going to pursue that. So this is very important. And uh, frankly speaking, until this moment, when I'm engaged in a project, I have to remind myself, to remind the team to think positive. <laughs> um, that's why I use the uh, six thinking hats. Have you heard about, sin uh, I talked about the uh, uh, six thinking hats before, uh, because one of the hats is actually uh, very optimistic, you know, if, if everything will work well and even more. 
So we can include these optimistic scenarios also uh, when we are doing our analysis. Uh, all, all, all groups uh, fight for the black hat. So. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and actually, uh, as human beings, we are wired to think of uh, the negatives three times faster than we think of the positives. And I think it's part of the evolution uh, because we, we, we need to uh, detect the dangers uh, in our environment. So that's why we need to remind ourselves to... Um, uh, to think of, you know, the positive. So, for example, here, um, some positive risks for uh, the uh, Brewhaven uh, uh, app. So, here, positive user feedback and adoption. The opportunity, the mobile app receives overwhelming positive user feedback, increasing customer adoption and loyalty. So, uh, see here, this is... Uh, a good opportunity but if i'm not prepared for it it might crash uh, the app uh, and and actually it it happened um i believe uh, princess catherine of wales in in the uk um appeared the one time wearing a, a dress from uh, uh it's high street it's something like H and M, but it's a different uh, brand. And uh, that day, the website of uh, that uh, brand crashed because it was affordable. Uh, I believe it was like two hundred dollars or something. So all the women <laughs> everywhere uh, uh, went to buy the dress. So it's a very good opportunity. But if we are not ready, uh, it might. To trans transform into a risk or it might pass and we don't get uh, we don't capitalize on it so the response here is to exploit this opportunity by featuring positive reviews of, on the app uh, promoting it as a user favorite and launching a referral program to uh, to increase or encourage users to bring more customers. So, okay, I, 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 I have to be prepared for this. And also the IT team should be prepared for this. So we have overwhelming uh, number of users using the app at the same time, for example. Uh, okay, we have here efficient uh, resource allocation. The opportunity, the project is efficiently managed, uh, resulting in resource savings. So actually, instead of the six months, we managed to do it in five months. And actually, um, we didn't need uh, three software developers. We, we needed only two. So we can, we can save. So the response mitigate uh, resource waste and uh, uh, redirect to save the resources toward enhancing the app the app's feature. So I can increase the scope and include uh, other features that I excluded earlier uh, because I didn't have much time or um, uh, or uh, uh, budget for this. So it, it's very beneficial actually to think of uh, the, uh, the positive as much as we uh, think of uh, the negatives. So any questions so far? Any questions? Okay, so this is very important. Okay, we we identified risks. We decided how we will deal or respond to each risk, positive or negative. How does this actually impact the project in numbers? So it will impact it in two ways. We will create a contingency fund. So if we need more money, we will use this money to implement the response. And also we will add time buffers. Uh, so it will not impact the schedule. So contingency funds are funds assigned to cover the project risks. Whether we identify them or unknown. 
because we don't know what we don't know. So we can we can assign uh, one element says unknown risks. What if something happens that we didn't think of? And um, these contingency funds are divided into contingency reserves and management reserves. The contingency reserves are to cover the identified risks that you set with, with your team and you identify them, you specify the specific response uh, responding to these risks and you calculated how much money you need to cover this. The management reserve, it covers the unidentified risks or unknown. Uh, from experience, contingency reserves are the authority of the project manager. So yes, I can have some fund to cover this. Uh, the unknown or unidentified, it's um, um, it's in the hands of um, a higher personnel, maybe the sponsor of the project or someone in the senior management. They have their management reserves. And in many cases, the management reserves are related to some strategic fund. So the senior management can uh, uh, authorize funds from the management reserve for different projects. Uh, for time, we need to create time buffers. So, and and actually, we use these uh, these terms. And even in on the personal level, uh, now literature or books talking about uh, uh, personal life, uh, uh, managing your budget, things like that, uh, or productivity, we use these uh, terms as well. So uh, um, adding a cushion. Um, remember when we used to um, calculate the slack time? This can help me also with thinking of time buffers. So we can add extra time uh, for those activities that if a risk happen, it will affect this, uh, this activity. So I can add more time. Uh, if this happens, I still have a couple of days to deal with this, um, uh, with this risk, and then uh, we will go back to our normal activities. Um, uh, also, we have merge activities. Remember merge activities, that those activities that has outputs from other activities. Uh, so one of these activities will take longer than the other activities. So we can add also buffer at these merge activities, anticipating delays in the activity that will merge into it. Uh, we can also add it to non-critical activities. Critical activities are those with slack zero. So it has to start here and, 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 and finish uh, there. So we can add some buffer to these non-critical activities so they don't turn into um, uh, critical activities and they create another uh, critical path. Uh, uh, also, those uh, that will require scarce uh, uh, resources. So maybe I have only uh, uh, in the company a, a, a quality assurance uh, or testing uh, a professional. And this one is responsible for uh, uh, several projects. They are assigned to several projects. So if something happened in, in another project, it will impact this person's schedule and it will impact my, uh, uh, my project. And I don't have access to any other uh, resource. So all of these you think of, so you can, when you are designing your uh, a schedule or planning your schedule, you can add these time buffers. Uh, here, for example, 
uh, uh, these, uh, these different activities on the left, uh, you will calculate it the normal way and you will create the budget baseline for these activities. Uh, then you will add budget reserve. So these are the contingency reserve or maybe contingency plus management reserve. So you will have the actual project budget. It's the budget baseline plus the budget reserve that you created uh, as a response to uh, the different uh, risks. Uh, any other any question so far? Okay, so. Now we identified risks, we assessed the risks, we thought of the responses, we created time buffers, we created contingency um, uh, reserves or funds. How can we control uh, the risk response? So the first step is to create your risk register, and this is one of the most important uh, templates or forms that you will use as a project manager. So in this document, you will have uh, all the identified risks. Uh, you will have descriptions. You will categorize them. Uh, you, were, you, you will assess the risks. You will include the uh, right response. You will, you will assign it uh, to a risk owner or someone responsible for this. Uh, and you will and you will use this risk register over and over at certain intervals to check up on these risks. You also need some risk control mechanism. So uh, how will you execute the risk response? How will you monitor the triggering events? Uh, how will you initiate the contingency plan? Also, how will you watch for new risks? Because risks will keep emerging because we uh, the environment of, of the project is not 100% stable. There are certain changes, internal, external, at so many levels. Uh, that's why we establish a change management system because each time... Uh, okay. Because every time we face a new risk and we have uh, to initiate a, a response, we are making a change. So we need a system to control the changes. So we need a system to monitor, to track, to report to the risk. So if, if one of your team members identified risks, um, there should be a, a way to report these risks to you and also a way uh, to report these risks uh, to uh, other stakeholders. Who needs to know about this risk? Uh, fostering an open organization environment. So it's, it's the communication, you know, we need a, a transparent communication. So uh, you might be in a situation and one of your team members to come and they reported the risk too late, for example. Um, and, and we need to do this risk identification and assessment workshops or meetings over and over. So maybe in your monthly meeting with your team, you will assign a specific time to revisit the risks again and think of maybe a new risks emerged, whether positive or negative opportunities, uh, and how can you uh, respond to this? Okay. Uh, uh, also, very important is the documentation. So you need to create a documenting uh, a documentation system uh, and assign it to someone who can keep your risk register updated and keep the right stakeholder informed some risks you need to communicate to the team 
but not to the customer, for example. Or, no, we have to include the customer because this might impact uh, the schedule or the budget or something like this. Uh, here is a, um, a, uh, a template I found online. You know, it shows how this risk register uh, will uh, look like. And of course, there are so many templates and, and, and software applic and application that will help you with this. So of course, we have um, a, uh, details about the project itself. And also, we have our um, uh, criteria to categorize the risks. So high, we will consider the risk to be high risk if it will cost us more than 7,500, uh, um, I think this is uh, sterling. Yeah, I think this is sterling, um, a pound to deal with. Uh, medium between 1,000 and uh, 7,500. Low risk if it is less than. Uh, 1,000. <coughs> uh, of course, here, you know, uh, they have approximate uh, uh, probability uh, times impact uh, in terms of monetary value. Uh, in some other ways, we might have an abstract number. So, for example, probability 5, impact 5, so the risk. Uh, value will be 25 and this is the highest uh, risk. So this is the most critical risk that we will deal. And it, it depends on the scale or the way that you use. I usually use one, two, three, four, five scale for uh, probability and the impact. And I use this monetary value uh, to define what is considered the level five, what is considered level four, what is considered the level one, and so on. Um, here is, they have, for example, risk author. This is the one who writes or detected uh, the risk. It's different than the risk owner. This is the responsible person for the risk. And here they have the risk actionee. The, the the person who will deal with the risk. So for example, if we have a sub team for quality assurance, so the risk owner might be the team leader, but the risk actionee might be a team member who will act actually, who, who will perform the test, for example, okay? So the more detail you add, in your risk register, the better actually, because you can you can here see everything, and you need a, a system so this register gets updated. So that's why uh, in our regular meetings, uh, we will assign some time to revisit the risk register and make sure that we deal with this. Uh, for those of you who work in IT, you might be using different terminologies. Uh, you might be using issue log, log and backlog. So these are some of the terminology that we are used in, uh, in, in IT. Uh, also, certain industries, they might have also certain specific terminologies. So in manufacturing, we had specific terminology that we uh, we were using. Uh, in health and safety, for example, they have uh, other terminology that, that they are um, using. So any question? Any question? Okay, we are we are wrapping up. So so here for the change uh, control management. Uh, we need to identify the sources for change. Uh, so are these changes related to the scope uh, or related to the implementation of the contingency plan 
or sometimes these are improvement changes so um, uh, we discovered an opportunity to improve so we will change to enhance something uh, and we create a system uh, and usually when we say in project management there is a system it means that there is a um, a process steps and documentation so whenever there is a change uh, there is a change request form that has to be uh, completed. Uh, of course, someone will identify the change. Uh, they will um, uh, think of the expected effects uh, of these changes, mainly on the schedule and budget, but it might affect other aspects of the project objectives. Uh, you need a system to review these changes or these change requests to, to evaluate it and also to decide, are you going to approve it or disapprove it? So uh, I'm not sure if I uh, shared this uh, story with you, but um, one time, one of um, a, my students, he was Indian working in rural India in communication and his company, uh, was assigned to build a communication tower. Um, they did this, or they were working on this, and the customer said, there is also a software that needs to be set up. Uh, can you help me to set up this uh, software? So the project, uh, the team member went to the project manager, asked them a permission uh, to implement or, or uh, to set up the software and the project manager refused and that team member who was my student he said this is an example of bad leadership because we could easily do this it will take less than two hours from my time and um you know i will have a happy and satisfied customer uh, but in the discussion within uh, the class they, they they came up with certain uh, things. What if you missed up the setup? Uh, what if this setup was assigned to another com a company and the company refused and they found that this is breach of contract, for example? Um, uh, so the project manager was right to disapprove uh, this change request. So in real life, some changes will be disapproved based on the uh, impact of the change on the schedule or the budget or the quality or the stability of your um, a project. Uh, you need to negotiate and resolve the conflicts of change or condition or cost. So you might implement a change, but you will find that this change will impact something else. So you need also to detect this and see how you can handle this. You need also to communicate the change to the stakeholders or the party that uh, either will do the change or will be impacted by the change. Uh, you need to assign this uh, change to someone who will be responsible. That's why we have change request forms. Uh, in that change request form, I don't know if I added here. Okay. Okay. I might add uh, here um, a template. Uh, part of the template will be to describe the change. Another part will be the approval or disapproval and why. And uh, the third part will be, okay, this one is approved. Who will be responsible for implementing the change? Where we will get the money? Uh, uh, how we will uh, uh, adjust the uh, the schedule and the budget and so on? And also, you need to track all these changes uh, uh, throughout your uh, project. And ris uh, risk responses will lead to these changes. So you need a system uh, to manage uh, this. Um, so here is the process. So he, a change originates, whatever the reason. So 
uh, a specific party submit uh, a change request. Uh, someone needs to review the change request. Sometimes we have a committee that deals with all change requests. So this committee will include uh, members that are representative to different functions within your project. So um, when a decision is taken, is not taken in isolation of the other aspects. So uh, one, one entity will approve a change, but it will impact other things within your project. Uh, if it is approved, it will go through. If it is not approved, uh, uh, it will be highlighted in the uh, the change request uh, that was uh, submitted. Of course, with reasons why it was disapproved, and of course, why it is approved. Um, once a change is approved, you need to update all the documentation uh, related to this change. And then you need to assign it to someone to implement the change. So very, very important to have a change control system in your um, uh, in your project uh, because you, you, you will have a formal process to detect the changes, uh, to detect the impact of any change on uh, the work breakdown structure, for example, or, or the performance measures. Um, uh, the allocation and the use of a uh, budget so you can track um, um, these funds or these budgets. Uh, uh, also, uh, to be very clear who will implement it. That's why usually a change request updates so many things in, in your project and your project documents. Um, so that's why you need to uh, uh, to have a solid change control system in place. Oh yeah, I included it. Yeah. So this is this is a sample change request. Of course, details about the uh, the project. Uh, um, you will give the re the request uh, a unique number. Uh, who originated this um, uh, this change? Uh, the date and um, uh, maybe the change is requested by a different entity, for example. This is the description of the request. Sometimes we include other data or other uh, technical uh, documents also to show why this um, uh, change is requested. Um, reason. Uh, areas of impact. So, what this change will impact? Will it impact the scope? Will it impact the cost? Will it will it impact uh, the schedule? Will it, will it impact the risk management? Will it impact the quality standards? Will it impact the resource allocation? Uh, here, uh, is it approved? Is it disapproved? Um, uh, or do we ask for amendments or more clarification? Uh, also, the priority of the change. That's why we have here emergency. This is this is a way to deal with unknown unknowns. Yeah. Or is it urgent or the priority is low? Uh, where I will get uh, the funding? Is it from the management reserve or the contingency reserve or the customer will pay for this? Maybe it's extra um, uh, extra work. Uh, and sign off approvals. Some change requests will have more details more than this. Yeah. Uh, also, we have a change request log. So remember, we gave each request number a unique number. So we can detect. So this is the request number. This is a high level description of the request. Uh, we have a reference document to support it uh, or documents. Uh, the dates of the request, the, the dates it, it, it was submitted, uh, the amount of money 
that um, um, was assigned to it and what's the status of it if it is approved not signed or not assigned uh, is it if, if it is open uh, if it is uh, only submitted but not reviewed uh, I don't know what's ROM here stands for but these are coming from um, uh, I, I don't, okay, what do we have here? Yeah, okay, uh, ROM here, rough order magnitude. So they have certain terminologies here in this company and they have a key uh, to show what it is. But this is a centralized log that you can detect as a project manager at a glance. You will see, okay, I have these numbers of, uh, I have one, two, three, four, four change requests submitted, but not yet uh, opened, but not yet approved, but not yet um, uh, handled. Uh, I have uh, some requests that are closed. I have some requests that are in progress and so on. Okay, <laughs> we reach at the end of, um, uh, of our uh, class today. So any question? I know that we covered lots of information, but for your, um, your assignment, I would love to see, uh, okay, what I want to see in your project. I want to see a risk breakdown structure or uh, um, a, an Ishikawa diagram. So if you do a risk breakdown structure, you don't need to do the, the Ishikawa diagram. If you do the Ishikawa diagram, it will just will show uh, in a different way. Personally speaking, I love the risk breakdown structure. For me, it's more streamlined. And, and you can add as many layers as you can. Um, so I will only um, ask for two levels only. So the project and one level and the second level, okay? Uh, professor, can I ask yes. a question? Yeah, is RBS same as SWOT? Mm -mm. Okay, good. No, 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 no. They are no. totally different. The work bre breakdown structure is related to the activities of the project. The risk breakdown structure, it's related to the sources of risks and what possible risks that could happen. So they are a breakdown structure, but one for, for activities and one for risks. Yes, sir, because you said in the individual assignment that will provide is WOT. So we need again to add this RBS. So it's not written in your project, in your um, individual assignment, yeah. Uh, no, in your individual assignment, you don't need this. No, okay. I'm I'm talking about the group assignment. Okay. Yeah. Good. In yeah, in 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 the group assignment, because it's part of the uh, the project uh, plan. You need to include your risk management plan. So the risk management plan will include the risk breakdown structure that shows the sources of risks in your project. And this will be different from a project to another. Okay. Um, uh, I need to see uh, some sort of assessment. So I need to see um, a, a heat map. So the identified risks and what's the level of the risk? Is it a major or moderate or minor? How will you uh, calculate this? I ask you only to calculate the impact and the likelihood. And again, it's subjective. So the impact is here is three. And why is that? Because this will uh, cost a certain amount of money uh, or, or something like this. So only the impact and the likelihood of the different risks. Um, uh, of course, like a table showing how will you respond to the to the risks uh, well for me if you include uh, five risks 
in different sources. So for example, to make it easier for you. Uh, for example, the technical risk, you identified only one risk, the external risk, only one risk. It's okay, you know. So in total, five risks in uh, due to different sources. If you want to add more, yeah, why not? If you do the uh, uh, the brainstorming and you have this, capture it. This is work done. <laughs> so I, I expected to see uh, the uh, the heat map. I also expected to see uh, a table that showed the response. How will you respond? So here, I, I I would love to see a risk response matrix. How will you respond to the risk? And what is the contingency plan? And maybe think of a trigger um, uh, for uh, for the contingency plan. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, you can include some positive risks as well. Yeah, you can include some positive risks. I don't. I don't want more than this. So I do. I don't want uh, more than this. So see what what I did to the uh, Brew Haven case and do uh, something similar. And in real life. Risk management might be very, very complicated, depending, of course, on the project, the complexity, the technical aspect of the project. Um, so any question? Any question? Thank you for that clarification so that we cannot submit a bunch of pages on you. <laughs> OK. Yeah, mm -hmm. one more thing. Would you like to move uh, the time uh, to 9? AM in a state of 10. So we can accommodate this one hour uh, time shift. Okay, Liazette said okay. Yes, okay for me. Okay. Judirin said yes. yes. What that yes. is? Yes, okay for me. Okay, Chan, yes. I actually can do pool in the chat, in WhatsApp chat. Okay, yes, okay. So Leah, let's start up a, uh, a poll, and let's see. And even I can I can do it now, but we don't have everyone here. We have only twelve. Yes. So we, yeah. We have so no it, idea in our area that is the time zone has changed. So this has made a confusion with us. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. In some in some we're, places we're, they I'm don't change it. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know that it, the changes, so we keep it. So just. Uh, when we have any announcement, please, Jan, just to tell us about. Uh, okay, what happened? Will... What happened is is that my alarm updated during the night, so instead of waking up uh, at uh, waking up at a certain time, I I wake up one hour late. <laughs> so. That... <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so Leah, that will start a poll, so we can we can um, uh, we can. Uh, decide okay <laughs> okay and if you have any question please uh, don't hesitate to ask me risk management is really interesting and you will have an interesting discussion uh in your teams okay okay so thank you yes, so course. much thank and you. i thank you and i will see you next week bye bye, bye, -bye. thank you, thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Uh,